Welcome to PayPod, the show that features thought-provoking interviews with leaders and entrepreneurs in the payments and financial technology industries. From credit card processing to Bitcoin, we cover it all. So if you want to know what's happening right now in the payments industry, stay tuned. Now, here's your host, Scott Hawksworth. Hey, how's it going, PayPod listeners? Scott back with you, and buckle up, because we have another excellent show on tap for you. This week, our discussion turns back to the world of payments, and more specifically, digital payments. There are so many organizations out there, especially banks and international businesses, wherein payments and money transfer are a crucial part of their operations. Efficiency and function can have direct impacts on bottom lines and growth. Given that, goals for speed, less friction, excellent security, and beyond put payments tech at the forefront for many of these organizations. But how exactly can it all be achieved? What are some of the specific payments technologies pushing things forward? I'm so thrilled to be joined by Lawrence Cook, who is the founder and CEO of NanoPay. NanoPay is one such fintech working to reimagine payments by empowering businesses and banks to scale with innovative payment and liquidity management products. Lawrence has a tremendous amount of insight to share with us on all of this. So let's just jump right in. Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. To start us off, can you just tell us a little bit about your career? How'd you end up founding NanoPay? What's the story? Yeah, so I'm a, I'm a reformed telecom guy. I used to run Bill Mobility here in Canada and, uh, you know, had lots of employees and we made lots of money, but it was a very traditional business. And at some point I went to the board and said, actually, I think payments are going to be bigger than telecom. And they, they, they laughed me out of the room. They're like, you must be nuts. And I said, well, you know, can we give free access to our SIM card to all of the financial institutions? And they're like, why would we do that? And I said, well, because then all of their payments will go over our SIM cards. And they're like, well, how do we monetize that? And I said, I don't know. We'll work that out later. But when all the volume's going over our SIM card, and they're like, oh, no, 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 that's not how we work. We need to have the negotiation up front. I'm like, that's what we want to do. No payments will be going through our SIM card in 10 years' time. I'm happy to take a bet on that. So we took the bet, and obviously I won the bet, although I've never collected. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it was really clear to me that payments were a huge problem in just about uh, every industry. And for me, to compete at a country level, you need two things. You need a uh, robust telecom infrastructure, and you need a robust and flexible payments infrastructure. And if you have those two things then you can build whole other industries on top of them. But those are table stakes just to be able to do commerce and compete globally. Um, so for me, I was super frustrated that we were really bad at this. And I was even more frustrated that there are people all around me running around saying, no, we're the best at this. We're the best country at this. And I'm like, we're just delusional. This is terrible. <laughs> and when we, you know, last year, the Department of Finance here in Canada did a survey and some analysis. And they came to the conclusion that we have $30 billion a year in payment friction. Wow. 2% of GDP. Wow. And all of that can be eliminated and in a very short period of time. So if you take that at a global level, it's literally trillions of dollars that we're wasting for absolutely no reason. That's massive. And just to really crystallize it for folks, um, I sort of gave the brief intro. For those who may be unfamiliar, what does NanoPay do in the world of payments? What services are you offering? And what businesses and organizations are you tending to serve? Yeah, so the first thing is that soon after starting, we acquired a mint chip from the Royal Canadian Mint. And the Royal Canadian Mint is owned by the federal government in Canada. And they'd built this platform to literally digitize cash. So it was the first central bank digital currency or the first stable coin equivalent. And we bought that technology from the Canadian government in 2015 with the express intent of fundamentally building new rails because there's been lots of payment innovation, but all the payment innovation has been in the front end. It's lipstick on a pig. The underlying <laughs> rails themselves haven't changed. And we said, no, 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 we have to change the rails. So we bought this tremendous asset and it was a fantastic asset, but it was very retail focused and it really only did 30 transactions per sec. You know, unique IP, great stuff, but not something that you could really scale. So we set about scaling that infrastructure. And then we said, now that we've got a robust, secure, scalable infrastructure, 
what are the different use cases and who, who can we sell this to? And the very first conclusion we came to is that we do not want to compete with banks. We want to be complementary. And we do not want to compete with central banks. We want to be complementary. So we primarily go to business by selling our service to, directly to banks or in a white label fashion for banks to serve their customers. So currently we have two main products. The one is called Connect. Connect is a platform that is both available in API and also in a portal form. And the API is really used by bigger entities and the portal, which is white labeled really for SMEs, to be able to move value around. So it's multi-currency. You can pay in, I think it's 165 countries now oh, wow. through the plat platform. So it's pretty flexible and, you know, it abstracts your banking information away. So, you know, we think about payments and we say payments are slow, payments are expensive. And most importantly, you cannot trace where your money is and payments are dataless. So we try to fix all of those problems, make them cheaper, faster, transparent and data rich. I actually think data rich in the long run is going to be the most important thing of them all. And that will eliminate some of that, you know, 30 billion a, a year in payment friction. But we've tried to eliminate all of those in this product. And so what it does is it simply allows a small business to go and make all of their payments through a single portal and do all their business to business transactions. And the actual way that we make the payment in the background is actually irrelevant. Like when you send a piece of mail or an email, do you actually know how it actually gets to the other end? No, absolutely not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no clue, right? And, but you do have a menu of options. You can go, well, I want this fast or, or I'm, I want to pay less and it's going to get there in two or three days. And that's what payments should be like. We should say, well, we want to track our payment to make sure that it gets there on time. Or we want to expedite it and do it really quickly. Or we want it to happen at this exact sec second in the future. So you should be able to schedule it so that you can choose when it's going to happen. So how it actually gets there, whether it's a wire or whether it's going through ACH or whether it's going through a faster payment rail, should be relevant to the end customers. It's like, who do you want to pay and how much is it? Because that also might determine what the fees are, just like sending a parcel. If you send a large parcel, it's more expensive than sending a letter, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to change the whole paradigm about payments to serve who the end customers are. And end customers in businesses are finance people. In big businesses, they're treasurers, uh, which leads me to the second thing. Is Our second product is Liquid. And Liquid is a real-time intercompany cash and liquidity product. We offer it to banks to give to the enterprise clients. But surprisingly, many banks have said, no, actually, we want to use it internally. And I'm not talking about small banks. I'm talking about large global transaction banks saying, actually, we can use your product to manage our own liquidity and cash management to manage their own liquidity and cash management. And they also have other issues related to collateral that they have to have with the central banks in that. So Liquid is designed to manage those intercompany movements of money, really understand where all of your risk is. And again, a multi-currency environment. So there are so many businesses, and this is true of small businesses and large, that have pools of money in the wrong currency in the wrong country, and they cannot aggregate it and get access easily. And Big banks offer these services in treasury and, and cash management, but it's manual and slow and you have to go in and uh, make changes. So simple things. You want to set up an intercompany loan. Every intercompany loan has to have an interest rate and you have to pay tax on that interest. And to change that interest rate, which has to be in line with uh, prevailing interest rates because you cannot make up an interest rate and give your company a better <laughs> deal than you can get outside right? Um, because otherwise the governments are losing out on their tax, you have to go into a bank branch to actually change the interest rate. So we've taken things that are really complicated and time consuming and expensive for a bank to deliver and we've automated them and we've made them simple and we've made them self-serve so the enterprise does all that work. So instead of having hundreds of bank accounts, you can literally just have one bank account and thousands of virtual bank accounts and move money between them in multiple currencies, move money between different entities, create intercompany loans. And that doesn't stop you from paying out on behalf of or receiving funds to only these virtual accounts. So we provide that entire infrastructure for the bank. And then all the bank has to worry about is the primary DDA where the actual money sits. And we can move everything around in real time. So instead of taking days to move money and sending expensive wires at the end in intercompany transfers, all that happens on our ledger in real time. 
Wow. So very much so, whether we're talking about payments and cross-border and challenges with friction and costs and all of this, or we're talking about liquidity and a large bank or organization just moving money around and, and doing things like that, really what, what you guys have built and are continuing to improve is just a new infrastructure for them. Do I have that correct? Yeah, so, so what we have is we have a core transaction platform that can now do over 50,000 transactions per second. So just to give you a reference point, that's more than Visa and MasterCard can do globally on billions of dollars of hardware. So 50 transactions per second um, at a fraction of the price. And then what we have is these modules called Chico modules, which we call cash in and cash out. And that's the connection to the legacy rails. So what we can do is you can move funds uh, around in real time in ISO 2022, which is the next generation payment standard that are data rich and has the underlying invoice. Imagine being able to click on any transaction in your bank statement and it pops up the actual invoice that you paid so that you know <laughs> that you bought 20 widgets right? instead of just who you pay because who you paid is irrelevant. And then you spend weeks and you have to hire so many people to Go and make sure that you reconcile everything in your bank to your accounts. And then you have an order to come and check to see that you've done that right. In our platform, it's automatically done for you. Auditing is going to become fantastic. Then you'll to push a button and just see the one or two that have not already been connected and reconciled because they'll be the anomalies rather than the rule. So you embed all of that within. So you've got this rich data and this borderless, frictionless, almost costless infrastructure, but it's still connecting to the existing rails. And it still has to connect to the existing rails because we are talking about a two-sided market. And you cannot deliver a two-sided market without being able to serve everyone. So we want ubiquity, and we achieve the ubiquity by saying, okay, in this country, they've only got this payment system, so we're going to connect into it. But that's irrelevant to the end user because the end user is using our platform, and we will get the money there. That's our job. Right, right. You guys worry about the other rails and connecting to the existing ones. And your goal is to make everything so self-contained so that the user is not having to worry about that, right? Correct. Correct. And we want to uh, eliminate all the risks. So if we look at global transactions today, the way it actually works is all banks have bank accounts with other banks all around the world. And they store their money in these Nostro Vostro, which, by the way, is Italian for mine and yours, accounts in foreign currencies. So let's say you're Bank of America and you want to make a payment to the UK. You've got to buy sterling and then put in your Barclays bank account. And then when one of your clients wants to send money to the UK, you say to Barclays, hey, please can you pay out this other, other person on our behalf out of our bank account in the UK? And then Barclays do that for you. But you're sitting on a whole bunch of money in sterling. So then they decide that they're going to leave Europe and sterling goes through the floor. Now you've lost money. And if that is a billion pounds, you've lost a lot of money. It impacts your balance sheet. And if you're taking that risk across 150 currencies, and let's face it, there are a lot of countries that are a lot more volatile than the UK, you're taking real risk. And then once that money's gone, you've got to buy more sterling to top up your bank account. So you've got enough for tomorrow's transactions. So it's a very pedestrian way of doing things. You take credit risk, currency risk, settlement risk, and most importantly, almost unlimited AML risk, because it's the responsibility of the other financial institutions in the food chain to do all the AML background checks. And if they don't do that properly, you're on the hook. So you're trusting that this other party that you might never have met is going to do their job adequately. So we think that's a crazy way of doing things. It's bad for liquidity, because we've got all this redundant cash sitting in there. It's bad for risk, and that's credit risk and uh, currency risk. It's bad for settlement risk, guaranteeing that you have to give your clients a bad, a bad rate. And ultimately, it's really bad for business because you have to say no to so many transactions because you don't know that the counterparty is going to do the right job on AML and uh, terrorist funding. Absolutely. And it's just so incredible how technology, it's right there to enable this and solve these issues. I'm curious, I want to shift and talk about security and fraud management and things like that, because these are things that we've talked a lot about on this show. And anytime you're talking about 
new technology, you're talking about having more data in individual transactions. Clearly, there are going to be people who are having security at the forefront of their minds. What is NanoPay's philosophy when it comes to security? And without getting too technical or revealing too much for any bad guys who may be listening, how do you put that philosophy into action with your products, with what you're offering here and proposing? Yeah, so the first thing that I should say is that traditional payments are the least secure. And the reason for that is a lot of the background infrastructure is essentially manual. And when it's manual, it relies on human intervention to actually activate the payment. Now, if you allow humans to activate the payment, they can also create their own payments because you're allowing a human to intervene. So you've got people who have infrastructure jobs, they're programmers that develop databases um, or other payment systems that have access to all these systems that they themselves can actually make a payment. And if you're in our industry, you literally cannot even recruit someone without doing a background check. Because if they've got like bad debts or they've got money problems, the chances of them stealing are very, very, very high. And let's be clear, the vast majority of fraud and the vast majority of security breaches are inside jobs. So the first thing that we do is that our platform is designed as a full stack development where there's no human that ever has access to a database. So we develop everything using a framework, um, and our f- a framework called Foam actually develops the full stack, including the access to the database itself. So no human has access to a database, and about 95% of our code is written by a computer. The second thing is, although there are a lot of blockchain companies out there that do pretty incredible security things related to securing their blockchain, they don't use that same technology to secure the access or the PII or the usernames and passwords. Mm-hmm. And in our infrastructure, we've done exactly that. So we've used the same security that we've used to secure the ledger, and we put all that PII and that user information in the same ledger, secured by the same blockchain technology. Now, we're not a pure blockchain, and although we recently won Canadian Blockchain Company of the Year, we're not a pure blockchain because we don't have consensus or proof of work. We what we call a centralized ledger technology that gives us superior performance, but we still have the security and the immutable ledger. Which brings me to the next thing is we don't have a database that holds anything like a total that can be changed because the total is calculated and it's calculated from an immutable ledger that cannot be changed by anyone ever. Wow. So it's pointless even trying to hack our platform because if you did, you wouldn't be able to do anything. The only thing you could try to do is fake a transaction and it would be crystal clear because it would be unsigned and unsecured that it had not come from the right party. So very, very easy for it not to happen and it actually wouldn't happen in our ecosystem. So we actually expect to get hacked and I think every single financial institution and everyone in our industry does get hacked. And I tell you what, the first people to try our platform are all the bad guys. When we look at our onboarding In the first uh, couple of weeks after launching each of our our platforms, we say no to about 98% of people that try to sign up. (laughs) And at one level, it really hurts to do that, but it's the right thing. And that's why we've had no fraud in our our platform to date, which is fantastic. Security is right at the heart of what we do. So everything in our ledger is secured in an immutable ledger. The second thing about the way it is secured is we use cryptography, obviously, to secure that. And the cryptography, because it is a discrete microservice, can be changed at any time without impacting any of the other services. So we don't need to rebuild the whole platform when you want to change from one algo to another. We can just carry on and the entire ledger just remains intact. And that way we can swap out and make our platform quantum proof without interrupting any of our business. It just carries on. It's unseen to any of the end users. That's the kind of thing that certainly helps executives and, and others uh, in these organizations sleep better at night, knowing how secure it is. And, and it's such a great point about the inherent risk associated with, with lots of traditional payments where you know it's real manual and there are individuals that are involved with it because that's where a lot of breaches and things like that can occur. I'm curious, Lawrence, I want to sort of shift to talk, I guess, in a more general way about 
financial technology. You know, there are a lot of fantastic fintechs out there that are offering new products and services and they're leveraging blockchain and provide the hope to make all kinds of financial transactions smoother. And there are folks out there launching cryptocurrencies, offering new products backed by any kind of technology you can think about. Unfortunately, there are still many individuals and organizations that are slow to change or, or hard to convince in traditional spaces, whether it be banks or payments or, or, or what have you. They don't necessarily see the value in utilizing new products or they don't understand it. A lot of this is, this is how it's always been done and we don't need anything else. So my question, Lawrence, is how do you encourage adoption or for lack of a better term, sell large banks and other businesses on potentially transformational financial technology? How do you convince the dinosaurs, so to speak, that this is the future, this is the way it, it's going, and it's worth it for you to invest in this and, and give it your attention? That's a very, very good question. I think the first thing is our industry has incredibly long sales cycles. And I joke that, um, that often our sales cycle is longer than the career of the people that we're selling to. So some banks that we've been selling to and the actual person that we're dealing with has changed three times during the course of the sales cycle. That forces you to have really deep and strong relationships in the entities and the parties you're selling to. So it is a long sales cycle and that does make it incredibly complicated. In terms of dinosaurs, I don't think banks are dinosaurs and I don't think central banks are dinosaurs. I think they, they do this incredible thing in terms of global liquidity, in, in terms of lending. The whole platform of fractional reserve banking actually makes it possible for you and I to own a home and borrow money and buy a car before we've actually got all the cash to do it. You just cannot do that in a non-central bank backed digital currency because you can make up your own currency but there's actually not enough liquidity to go around to serve all the needs of everyone in the globe. And I'll give you a great example, a real world, world example. So Zimbabwe has pretty much been running on US dollars and it's been running on US dollars in cash for many years. There's a liquidity problem. So although there are enough dollars in US dollars in the economy to run the economy, none of it is sitting in a bank account and none of it is sitting in the central bank. So you don't have that 10x ratio you get from fractional reserve banking. So they've got enough money, but it doesn't move around fast enough and liquidity is slow. You can imagine this mo money moving around really slowly in the ecosystem. So everyone's always waiting for someone else before they can pay someone else. And that clogs up the whole system. So about a year ago, I saw an amusing article where they said, you can provide a goat as collateral for school fees. Um, and you're not allowed to slaughter it, but you can milk it. So it's kind of like the <laughs> interest equivalent. So the, the real, real world, world problems that can only be solved by banks and a cryptocurrency cannot solve that because there will not be enough liquidity. So the first thing is what banks do and what central banks do is very, very special and it cannot be replaced by a clever technology. So I think the important thing is to partner with financial institutions and with central banks to deliver the next generation. And there are a couple of economic things here. The first thing is our estimates suggest that financial institutions spend about 70% of their IT budget just keeping the lights on. And they're doing that because they have these old legacy systems, right? And if you speak to you know, people like Clayton Christensen, who wrote The Innovator's Dilemma and that, those guys have to innovate in their own businesses and they have to eat their own lunch and they have to fundamentally transform their own businesses. Otherwise, they will disappear. And the threat is not another bank is going to be smarter and take your clients. The threat is someone from the outside, a platform. I mean, Google is now getting into providing bank accounts. Sure, any bank in the background, but who's going to be better at serving the average millennial? A Wells Fargo or Google? I don't know. I'll put my, I'll put my money on Google. Google will get there pretty quickly, right? They can give you a, right. better increase, a better experience, and they're going to deliver that at a fraction of the cost. Really expensive for Wells Fargo to do. It's super cheap for Google to do. Right? And they've demonstrated that with so many other services that they've been able to deliver. So if you look at payments in India, in China, it's not dominated by banks. It's dominated by fintechs or payments companies. You know, Alipay and WeChat Pay, they have more customers than the biggest global banks in the world. 
way more. Yeah. And they're not only doing payments, they're controlling the entire ecosystem. So let's say you want to get on a plane from China and go as a tourist to New York City. They get their visa, they update their passport, they book their tickets, they book their hotels all through the platform. And then when they arrive and they go shopping, they only shop at shops that take Alipay or WeChat Pay. They never leave the ecosystem, not even once. And if you turn up today in China, um, and this has changed in the last couple of weeks where they made an announcement, but you know, and you try to pay with cash in any retail situation and certainly any food situation, there's just no chance. They don't even take cash. Yeah. And the sense of taking a card, you literally cannot get a taxi or transport or fast food without Alipay or WeChat Pay. Those are the only options. So I think the first threat to banks in terms of payments is you've got these massive platforms in Asia that are so much more scaled than any banking platform in the world. And they do that with taking very, very limited risk. So that's the first risk. The second risk to, to banks are the platform companies in the United States, including Amazon and Google and Microsoft and Apple. And Apple's got into this already. Amazon probably do more payments than any bank put together, right? In terms of, if you think about every time you purchase something from Amazon, the consumer's doing a purchase, and then there's another payment after that that goes to the end merchant or goes to whoever supplied the goods to Amazon themselves. And then there's another payment for whoever's actually going to deliver it if that's not Amazon. So every single payment results in multiple other payments in the background. They're doing way more payments than any bank. And Apple has already launched a credit card with Goldman Sachs. It's only a matter of time before they get into checking or digital money and then the money will never ever leave the Apple platform in the first place. It will never actually end up in a bank. Goldman Sachs will provide the back-end banking license and all of the KYC and AML and security and risk monitoring and fraud monitoring and that for them. But the front end that the end users will see will be an Apple experience. And what's better, an Apple experience or a Bank of America experience? <laughs> no, I mean, I think you make such a good point about really juxtaposing the the importance of central banks, but also the risks to central banks. And perhaps businesses like NanoPay and others that are offering these exciting products, maybe the key from the bank's perspective is to, and from their perspective, is to approach it as partnerships. And how can we leverage the crucial role that central banks play and their size and all the great things that they have, but then leverage our benefit as, you know, working for things like frictionless payments and seamless experience for the end user and those types of things. Is, is that, do you think, maybe the path forward? Absolutely. You know, I think in the short term, there's such a good opportunity for banks to work with fintechs to transform their offerings, to understand their customers better, to serve them better. But the real opportunity, which is a little bit longer term, is to fundamentally change their, uh, their core infrastructure. They're all using these legacy platforms that are designed to be batch. There isn't a millennial out there that wants anything at the end of day. They want everything now, instant gratification, real-time everything. And you cannot provide real-time everything with a batch, end-of-day payments infrastructure which at the heart of every bank, every bank is sitting on a core platform that does exactly that. And they have to build this layer on top of it to make it look prettier, to make it look more modern. But underlying, you've got this old legacy infrastructure that has to change. And if it doesn't change, you know, they will be uh, outsmarted by faster, cheaper alternatives. And just from a pure cost perspective, banks have to get off that legacy infrastructure. Absolutely. And and to sort of add to things like batching, I mean, even from the merchant side, we work with lots of different merchants. And when I'm on a sales call, one of the first questions I'll often get is, how soon can I receive my funds? You know, how often do you batch out, blah, blah, blah. That's the kind of thing that that even these businesses, you know, people want their money now. They want their transaction to be completed now. They want to be able to have things as efficient as possible. And the organizations that are going to help enable that and drive us forward, those are the ones that are going to have the success. Do you agree? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think it's not just the batch, but it's the data behind it. So if you're a merchant and you're accepting credit card payments, 
then you get the statement, which is the most complicated statement you've ever seen in your life. And what it does is it details a whole bunch of payments. And you know, when you're going to look at your point of sale and you compare that with the amount of money you receive, not a single one matches. <laughs> yep. So how do you reconcile? And so it becomes this nightmare of, okay, I know that $10.53 with the tax included and with the interchange is actually this. So I've got to reconcile it with that. That's a nightmare. And this happens in small businesses, but it happens in large businesses too. And it's incredibly complicated to really even understand what that statement is all about. And there's this very simple thing that if you just gave me the exact amount that is on my point of sale in your statement, I'd be able to reconcile it easily. And it's the simplest thing. And I can't understand why no one ever did that because they're trying to hide how much they're charging. Just be upfront. This is how much they're going to charge for it. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to make your reconciliation easy by giving you the right numbers. That's basic stuff. Absolutely. Lawrence, I want to turn our focus to the future here. If you could, real quick, peer into the crystal ball, what do you see in the future for NanoPay? Are there any specific technologies or products on the horizon that you can share that our listeners might find to be interesting and, and could really make an impact? Yeah, so, you know, a few things. The payments are going to be transformed by a number of things. I think blockchain is going to have an impact in what we can do in the payments world. Um, a lot of blockchain companies will have a glass ceiling in terms of their transaction scalability. But I think we've really overcome that. And if we've overcome that, others will as well. Mm -hmm. So I think blockchain is going to be important. I think in terms of other technologies, AI is going to be key. We've got so much um, fraud that adds so much cost and um, and makes the experience so much worse. I, you know, my, I'll just give you an example. I'm now on my fifth credit card this year because it's been compromised and they said there's fraud on your card and we have to give you another one. And then I go a week while I wait for another credit card. And then I have to take everything that I signed up to and redo that. And it just blows my mind that I have to go through that awful experience just to get a few thousand dollars back because my card is compromised again. And, you know, it's like I'm almost scared to use it because I know it's going to get compromised again and again. Uh, terrifying, terrible experience. So I think AI can eliminate a lot of that because it'll be able to predict when this stuff's going to happen even before it happens. So I think AI is going to be a huge thing in fraud and in, and in risk monitoring. And I think use the right way because there are some downsides the way we see it right now. And we saw that with uh, some of the Apple card where women got way lower credit limits than men. So obviously there's something wrong with the algos there. Mm -hmm. But AI used in the right way is going to be transformative. But I think the biggest thing is going to be central bank digital currency. When countries literally digitize their cash. Because the best transactions we do today are cash transactions where there's no credit risk. When I do a credit card, there are four parties involved in the transaction. When I do a cash transaction, it's just me and the receiving party. And neither of us take any risk on the other. We don't have to take any risk. There's no repudiation. There's no recourse. The transaction is done. I cannot, you know, say, say hold on, I want that money back afterwards. You know, in a credit card, you can do that a year later. And they just take the money away. And then you've got to explain, well, why you deserve to keep it. All right? In cash, it's very, very simple. You do the transaction, it's done. There's no repudiation, there's no recourse, there's very limited cost. And what it represents is a risk-free claim against the central bank. And that's different from bank money because bank electronic money, it takes bank risk. So you're taking risk of the financial institution. But when we move to central bank digital currency, we've eliminated all of those risks. So I think the biggest thing is going to be central bank digital currency, where central banks literally digitize their cash, and they would do it through banks. So it's not like, you know, I'm going to have an account with it, and every other consumer is going to have an account with the central bank. My account would still be with the bank, but I'd be able to take funds out of my deposit account, turn them into central bank digital currency in real time in the bank, and then make a payment that would be risk-free to the receiver and to myself. Wow, that's incredible. I'm is that the kind of thing that you're seeing just in Canada and do you think that CBDC, the central bank digital currency is the kind of thing that that will be, you know, in in the US and Europe and and could really change things globally for central banks? I think it is going to be uh, it will happen globally. I think it's going to happen in some of the economies where 
A, cash is disappearing, or B, there's too little liquidity at the moment. And some of those countries just pretty much have nothing to lose. So I think it makes sense that it happens in some of the fringe countries first. But I think it will eventually happen everywhere. You know, if we just think about the United States at the moment and the US dollar, I don't know what the stat is, but it's a crazy number. I'm just going to go with 50%. 50% of the $100 bills are not inside the United States. But where are they? We don't have a clue. <laughs> right. And that's sitting around in someone's mattress and that's probably being used for nefarious reasons or maybe just to store value because they're worried about their home currency. But all that, those funds are sitting out there. Imagine we digitized that and we knew exactly where all that money was. And we say, okay, well, we got, you know, 150 million sitting in Zimbabwe and we know who in Zimbabwe has it. You know, that would be transformative. So even if you started by digitizing the U.S. dollar outside of the U.S., that would be transformative to the United States. It would eliminate financial crime, would eliminate the fraud, it would all disappear. Because when we take cash out of the ecosystem, it's difficult to avoid taxes. It's difficult to do illegitimate sales. It's difficult to buy things that you shouldn't buy. It's difficult to fund terrorists. Mm -hmm. You can't just stuff things in mattresses and, 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 and do that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we saw this with some of the demonetization in India. The very first impact of the demonetization in India is Paytm took off. It became a real thing. And that's because people needed another way to pay. And Paytm was there and it worked. It was great timing for them. But, you know, there's such an opportunity to digitize central bank money. The other thing related to that is there are 2 billion people in the world that are unbanked or underbanked. And mm -hmm. those are the least served people. And frankly, banks can't even afford to serve them. It doesn't even make sense. But if we can offer the cheapest alternative, which is a central bank digital currency at a fraction of the cost, and all it requires is some sort of biometric capability, and then you can become a part of the formal financial sector, and you don't have to pay 10 plus percent to, to just receive money, we change 2 billion people's lives. And when we bring 2 billion people into the formal financial sector, actively involved in the economy, we change this world. Absolutely. All right. We have a segment we like to end with. It's every show we do this. It's five questions, rapid fire. Lawrence, are you ready? Sure. All right. You've been making a lot of predictions about what you, what you see in terms of the future of payments and fintech. What's a prediction in the future of payments that you expect will happen in the short term here? We're talking 12 to 24 months. So the first thing is, I think we will see a global fintech emerge that can compete with platforms larger than banks. So I think that's, that's what's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months. And it could be someone like Revolut, who's already in 20 plus countries, but someone like that's just going to emerge as a dominant player. We've had PayPal around for years, but they've never really competed with banks for their day-to-day -day business. Right. What's one cool piece of payment-related technology that you've come across recently that's unrelated directly to your company that impressed you? So I've seen amazing things, particularly with biometrics in the third world, where people who don't have the necessary paperwork and can't necessarily even read or write can identify themselves and receive a payment through an eye scan or through a fingerprint. And I think that's just going to change the third world and the rest of us will be scrambling to catch up. Absolutely. I'm so interested to see how that technology continues to develop and, and how it impacts everybody. That's going to be fascinating. In the next five years, most Canadians will make a purchase with either Bitcoin, Apple Pay, or some other thing. Which one do you think and why? I think it'll be some other thing. Bitcoin is never going to scale and be affordable for retail transactions. So I think uh, Bitcoin is going to be relegated to the background and, uh, and not grow. Apple Pay can only ever serve 50% of people because of their market share in the handset market. And 50% is high in North America. Android dominates uh, the rest of the world. So I don't think it'll be Apple Pay. So I think we're going to get to a place where we have what I call universal acceptance, where the merchant can receive your payment. And that is independent of the actual payment instrument you're using. 
So imagine you could use Bitcoin or Apple Pay or your credit card or a debit card or another cryptocurrency, and the merchant doesn't have to be aware of how that's being funded or where the money's coming from or indeed how it's being transported. So universal acceptance. It could be in a QR code or it could be a tap capability, but I think universal acceptance is the way forward. What's one piece of advice you would have for someone who's considering the payments or financial technology industry as a career? This is the most dynamic, exciting place in the world. It's been dominated by these big behemoths for so long, and it's changing so rapidly now. So my piece of advice is get ready for a roller coaster ride because uh, <laughs> you cannot plan more than six months in advance because everything changes. Absolutely. But that's what makes it so exciting. And I love just the unification of technology with the startup attitude that I think so many fintechs have. Um, it, it's really exciting things and then can really change the world, right? Yeah, absolutely. Last question here. What's the best business advice you've ever received and from whom? Yes, I went to London Business School and I had a professor there and uh, his advice was focus on cash flow. Cash flow is the most important thing in a small business or in a large business, in fact, in any business. So cash flow tells you everything. We've lived in this world where we don't really know where the money is, it's floating around in the ether, all that kind of stuff. Go with the cash flow. So uh, my professor used to say, go with the cash flow. And uh, I think that's the best advice I've ever received. I think that's fantastic advice. And uh, a lot of folks out there are doing startups and they're doing exciting things. They need to think about that. <laughs> What's the cash flow going? <laughs> exactly. Lawrence, I want to thank you so, so much for joining me on the show today, sharing NanoPay's story and the exciting things you guys are doing, and really sharing your perspective on where you know financial technology is and the exciting things that are happening in the world of payments and liquidity, um, because it is just so crucial. So thank you. No, thank you. And before I let you go, if folks are listening to this and they want to connect with NanoPay, they want to learn more about what you guys are doing, where should they go? How should they connect with you all? Yeah, so I guess uh, email or, or phone us. Email is really easy. It's Lawrence, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E at nanopay.net. And our phone number is 416-900-1111. Love it. Thanks again, Lawrence. Thank you very much. So that completes our show today. Thanks so much for listening. And don't forget to subscribe if you like the show. You can do so on iTunes, Google Play, and many other platforms. So until next time, I'll see you then. And thanks again for listening. Thank you for listening to another episode of PayPod, brought to you by Soar Payments. Soar Payments is a leading merchant services provider for e-commerce, high risk, and hard to place businesses. If you'd like to get the latest PayPod episode sent to you automatically, subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher, or visit soarpay.com slash podcast. <laughs>